Well, welcome to our evening service. As we end this Lord's Day in worship, uh, we have an opportunity to hear from God's Word in the book of Joel again. Uh, here in our text, we're looking at verses 18 through 20. Here we have the shift from the focus that we've seen on how we must uh, lament and repent, and now God answers in verses 18, really through the rest of Joel's prophecy. At this point, we will have the opportunity to sing together, and then when we come back, we'll read Joel chapter 2, verses 18 to 20, and then hear from God through that. I invite you to turn to Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. We'll read verses 18 uh, through 20 this, uh, well, it's it's morning. We've had to, had to be flexible in, with outdoor worship and indoor worship, so that's why I'm also here in my, my office here. But uh, nevertheless, this is God's word, and he has something to say to us. So let's read God's word here, verses 18 to 20 of Joel chapter 2. Hear now the word of God. And the Lord became jealous for his land, and had pity on his people. The Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I am sending to you grain, wine, and oil. You will be satisfied, and I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. I will remove the northerner far from you, and drive him into a parched and desolate land, his vanguard into the eastern sea, and his rear guard into the western sea. The stench and foul smell of him will rise, for he has done great things. Let's go to God in prayer. And our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that we can hear your answer. We give you thanks that you do respond to your people. We pray that we would have ears to hear your answer this uh, through this uh, prophecy. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I think there are plenty of examples in Scripture 
uh, that testify to the fact that asking God questions can be a tricky matter, a tricky business. In Ezekiel chapter 20, the elders of Israel, they come to Ezekiel and they inquire of the Lord through him. And this is what the Lord says. Thus says the Lord God, is it to inquire of me that you come? As I live, declares the Lord God, I will not be inquired of by you. Be a tricky business. Ask God questions. Let's consider again one more example here. Uh, Habakkuk's response or, or experience with uh, God. His mind is blown. When God, when he asks God, what is he going to do about the injustice in Israel? And God says, I am sending a foreign army to exile you. God's answer is, is unexpected for Habakkuk. It shows to us that it can be a tricky business to ask questions and inquire of the Lord. But no matter how unpredictable God's answers may be, that God answers is far better than having no answer at all. One of the most devastating critiques that can be leveled against a group of people is that their God does not answer. We see this in 1 Kings 18. As Elijah is competing against the prophets of Baal, he levels this rebuke and criticism against those prophets. He says this, the book of, of Kings says this, And as midday passed, they, the prophets of Baal, raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation, but there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. Indeed, as King Saul only knew too well, there is no more desperate place to be than in a time of trouble and in being separated from the word of God. So as we engage with our text, we need to acknowledge up front that the words that begin verse 19, the Lord answered, are quite significant. Though they are merely introductory to the actual answer that God will give to his people, the fact that the Lord answers his people in their time of need ought to encourage us. Though the relationship is far from mechanical, as we've seen about repentance and God's answering and forgiving, we can uh, derive great encouragement and comfort from the fact that those who humble themselves before God will be heard, and he will answer. And so the point of our text, the point of these three verses, this introduction to the Lord's answer to the repentant prayers of his people, is this, we serve a God who answers. We serve a God. Who answers? Very simple. Though we sin and, and though we fall short of the glory of God, God answers our sinfulness with sacrifice. Though we witness injustice of all kinds around the world and in the news, and such things might tempt us to lose hope that things will ever get better, God answers with the hope of the gospel. Therefore, we ought to be encouraged to continue in prayer to our great God, because we serve a God who answers. Now, as we look at our text, these, these three verses, this introduction, we'll, we'll think about this theme of, of God answering. But I need to say a word about the structure here before we go on. Now, I take, as, as will be clear, uh, verses 18 through 20 to be a summary statement of everything that follows uh, after it including the whole of chapter 3 in the book of Joel. I think these three verses here are laying out, in summary form, everything that is, is said afterwards. And so, let me just briefly make this point by, by uh, showing some of the correspondences here. In verse 18, we read of the Lord's pity and compassion on the land and his people. And we see that same idea picked up in verses 21 and uh, through 23 that seem to, to address the outworking of that the compassion. So there's a connection here, a summary statement about his compassion, and then a description of it in 21 through 23. Uh, verse 19, it describes the satisfying restoration of grain and wine and oil for God's people and the consequent removal of shame 
now that they've been restored. Well, verses 24 to 27 seem to echo that language of restoration and satisfaction and the removal of shame. So we see again a summary statement that's fleshed out later. Finally, verse 20 describes this removal of, humil of, of hostility, rather, a peace. And what the rest of Joel's prophecy really takes up is the idea of judging the nations and providing peace and rest to God's people. And so uh, what I want to do with the summary text is just to make a few observations uh, at, the, at the high level about what we learn about the fact that God answers, and then we will flesh out the ideas of the substance of God's answer uh, as we finish Joel's prophecy. And so let's begin our look at these three verses with this first observation that God's answer to self-interested, God's answer to self-interested. I've made this point in various ways a couple of times already, but it's worth repeating again here that God's answer in verse 19 flows from verse 18, which is describing his jealousy and his pity. Look at verse 18 with me. This is how our text begins, Then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. Here again, the land, but the land of the people, are designated as God's property. As Joel tells us that the Lord became jealous for his land, we can, we can almost hear the appeal that the priests had in verse 17, in the earlier verse, that he would have pity on his people, his land. These priests appeal to God's care for his possessions and his person, his own name. So we see here that when God answers, he indeed answers with self-interest. It is his people, his land. God's zeal for his own possession stirs him to answer, and he answers in his self-interested way. might be thinking to yourself, is it a problem that, that God answers in a self-interested way? Certainly not. The good of those who love God are bound up with God's concern for his own glory. We who are prone to greed may have trouble processing this in our minds, but since God is both good and unchanging, we need not fear that God's self-interest will exclude us. For this reason, there really is no better hope than that God would answer in a self-interested way when we pray. Now look at verse 19. We see another thing in these, in these summary verses about how God answers. We see that God answers to address our present needs. He addresses our present needs. And in a straightforward way, God tells his people that he is going to send them what they lack namely material uh, possessions, food. One commentator has noticed that it is curious how much emphasis is placed on the lack of grain and drink offerings in the earlier parts of Joel. That's, that's why they're lamenting in the earlier parts of Joel. But now, as God answers, there's no mention of, of the offerings. There's only mention of the raw products, raw materials of grain and wine and oil. Of course, the raw materials would then allow for that worship uh, to resume. But here we see God's emphasis on, on addressing the present needs of food of his people. This observation very much seems to be a practical outworking of what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. When he addresses the topic of anxiety, what he says is this, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And those things are clothing food. See, the call that uh, we had to lament earlier in Joel chapter 2 was a call to lament the disruption of worship, but the response is to add a restoration of both worship and provision. As you seek first the kingdom of God, God will address your present needs. So the point we need to see here is that God's answer includes our present need. The locust plague for the 
Israelites here has caused tremendous loss. We've seen throughout this uh, prophecy, but that loss, we're told, will be restored. But not only restored at a bare minimum, when God addresses our present needs, we also see that he satisfies. Again, that's what we read in verse 19. As God sends the grain and the wine and the oil, they will be satisfied or filled up completely by it. What that means is that God's answer is no stingy response to our present needs. When he addresses needs, he makes sure that we're satisfied. Now what I hope you get from this point is an enhanced appreciation for what it means for us to pray in the Lord's Prayer to give us this day our daily bread. As we humbly approach God and ask for our daily bread, we should be confident that he will satisfy us. He will give us what we need completely. Pray boldly for your daily bread. Pray expectantly. As God answers, he will satisfy. Now finally, in these verses, verse 20, we see God's answer addresses future concerns. Addresses future concerns. Look at verse 20. This is what Joel says. I will remove the northerner far from you and drive him into a parched and desolate land. His vanguard into the eastern sea and his rear guard into the western sea. The stench and foul smell of him will rise, for he has done great things. Now this verse is, is related to that future vision in Joel chapter 2 of the coming of the Lord's army. The people, having been warned in this vision to repent, and now having done so, God answers with this word of assurance that, that he will address their future concerns as well. It's important to note here that uh, the greatest threats to Israel came from the north. And so this, this nondescript uh, people, the northerner, represents the, any force of hostility in general against Israel. And so in, in Joel's prophecy, this, this really does double duty as, re, as representing actual human armies and also the Lord's army. And so the point then is that hostility against God's people will be wiped away completely. As God answers the prayers of his repentant people, he has in mind future concerns, hostility, peace. Indeed, we know there is peace because there is complete destruction that's represented here when God answers. The northerner's army, we read, is routed and spread in three separate directions. The main group is sent south into a parched and desolate land. The vanguard, we read, is sent to the east and the rear guard to the west. And so we see all four cardinal directions are represented in God's answer the future concerns of his people. When God answers, he addresses future concerns and he brings peace to his people. So as we wrap up these brief uh, verses that introduce God's answer, we have to be encouraged. We have to be encouraged when we pray that God is self-interested and he will work for his glory and our good. We have to be encouraged that God meets and satisfies our present needs, both material and spiritual. And that as God works and answers, he always has in mind our future concerns as well. So he will act in self-interest to prosper his people that his own name may be glorified. As we navigate through our present pandemic, we ought to uh, seek God's kingdom and know that he will satisfy our needs in this time. He will bring peace. And therefore we pray, knowing that God will answer. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks for this word. We thank you that you do hear our prayers and that when we pray to you, it is not in vain. Pray that we would take encouragement from these verses in our time. Be fervent and constant in our prayers to you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray.